Yes, we love questions. Well, thank you everyone for having me. It's my privilege to be here with you this evening. Uh, as Heinz just mentioned, my background is coming out of evolutionism and atheism, and now having very much the opposite view. It's one of the reasons I think this is an important topic to speak about because we live in a culture that increasingly has turned its back on God and is not even so much anti-God anymore as almost views God as being irrelevant, right? Nevertheless, science, logic, reason, rationality tells us there must be a God and that changes the whole conversation. And the purpose of presentations like this are to equip um, people, first of all, strengthen your faith. We do not have a blind faith uh, there's a lot of excellent reasons to believe what we believe, and also to share this information with others. And of course, this is a very large topic. Uh, the creation alone, how many different areas of science could we talk about? Uh, astronomy and space being my background, that is my privilege to speak to you about it here this evening. And I'm thankful too to talk about astronomy because there's kind of a stigma associated with astronomy sometimes that makes some people nervous. So we should talk about that up front. The rumor that you've heard is not true. It is not true that excessive stargazing will cause you to lose all of your hair. <laughs> in case you were wondering. So our topic tonight, I mean, even within astronomy, how many things could we talk about? We're going to talk about our solar system, uh, specifically the system that the Earth is within. Because, of course, we're familiar with the Earth, this being the planet that we live on. The other planets in our solar system also can tell us a lot about the question of origins, though. Our solar system consists of the sun, the Latin name is Sol, thus this is the solar system, right? The sun and everything that orbits around it. So moving outwards from the sun, we have Mercury, Venus, Earth, Mars, Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus, Neptune, and you'll notice Pluto got demoted. It's down here in the dwarf section now. We'll talk a little bit about Pluto too. As, we're going, as we uh, go through our time here this evening, we're going to visit each one of these planets briefly and ask the question, what is it and where did it come from? What can these objects tell us about origins and whether there's a creator or whether there's natural processes that somehow produced all of the things that we see? Now, there's really two competing models for how this all got here. And the biblical model is fairly straightforward. The Bible says, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. A very familiar verse to us, I would hope. And scripture clearly says, God created all that we see. Of course, this is not a popular view of origins today. Instead, the secular model, from those who are not endorsing a creation viewpoint, would say that all of these various objects formed on their own without a creator being involved. And the most popular secular model today is called the solar nebula model. The solar nebula model, um, as the name implies, is that everything came from a solar nebula, a big cloud of gas out in space. And so this model says this, in the beginning, there was gas. About four and a half billion years ago, there was a large cloud of gas that began to collapse under the force of gravity. As it did so, it formed a disk shape and began to swirl around. Within the gas, some of the gas condensed into dust particles. The dust particles then stuck together to become little rocks. The little rocks stuck together to become bigger rocks. Those bigger rocks then stuck together to become what are called planetesimals, basically asteroids. And then those stuck together in various ways to become the planets that we see today. There's a lot of problems with this process, as it turns out. I'm not going to go into detail here tonight because, um, because there's a lot of detail. We'll just set that aside for now and move further into the solar system and say, as we look at all these objects, do they look like they are the product of that type of process or not? Well, the first question is, how could we tell where these objects came from? Well, we could ask if they're consistent with this secular model. Do they look like they are the outcome of gas turning into dust, turning into rocks, collecting into planets? Do the planets look like they're the product of random processes, just being driven by the laws of nature, so to speak? Or do they look finely tuned and designed? And how old are they? Are they billions of years old, as this model would say? Or is there evidence of youth that these objects do not look old? So in our time tonight, we're going to discuss each planet. We're going to start close to the sun and work our way outwards and ask these questions and view each of these celestial objects through this lens and see what we wind up with. So the first four planets are called the terrestrial planets, Mercury, Venus, Earth, and Mars. The Latin name for Earth is Terra. 
And Earth is a rocky planet, as are these other three planets, and thus they are collectively known as the terrestrial planets. The smallest of these, and the smallest of all the planets actually, is the planet Mercury, closest to the sun, which makes it very hot there, as you might imagine. Mercury is interesting from a scientific standpoint and from a question of origins for a couple of different reasons. First of all, we discovered that Mercury is very dense. It has an iron core, basically a big ball of iron, occupying more than half of its volume. Now, this is interesting because that solar nebula model says Mercury can't be like this. It can't have a core this large. It can't be this dense. It's too dense for the model. The model says Mercury should be a lot lighter than it is, or at least less dense. There's no opposite, there's no uh, antonym in English for the word dense. So this creates a problem for secular modelers. How do you account for this planet being as dense as it is when the model says it shouldn't be? Well, when there's a problem, you need a solution. The commonly held answer to this issue within the secular community is that Mercury formed less dense than it is today. There was a lot of uh, lighter material associated with it at first, as their model would predict. And then an asteroid came along early in the solar system's history, struck Mercury, broke it up into pieces. The lighter stuff went off into space somewhere and is gone, leaving behind the denser material that we find there today. Now, what's the evidence for this collision having happened, though? Only that if it didn't happen, the secular model would be contradicted by the evidence. It's not really a very good standard of evidence, right? <laughs> and this turns out to not actually be a good solution to the problem anyway. For example, mercury has sulfur and potassium on the surface. These are very volatile elements, meaning they have very low boiling points. And it turns out that had such a collision occurred, volatile elements like sulfur and potassium would have evaporated away into space and be gone. So the fact that they're there today tells us that this collision didn't happen, which restores the issue of Mercury being too dense for the secular model to explain. And oh, by the way, the model also says volatile elements shouldn't be there in the first place, because this model makes predictions about what elements could condense out of the cloud, depending on the distance from the sun, and volatile elements can't have condensed out of the cloud in Mercury's neighborhood. So the model says Mercury shouldn't have volatile elements on its surface, because they couldn't have formed there, but it does. And had the elements been there, they wouldn't have survived this alleged collision, but they're still there anyway. Moving onwards, we find Mercury also has a magnetic field. This was a surprise when it was discovered by the Mariner mission, because planetary magnetism can have a couple of different possible sources, but they don't work if Mercury is old and having come from this solar nebula. So one possible way for a planet to have a magnetic field is called a dynamo, basically a generator being driven by um, currents of liquid metal inside of the planet. A dynamo could, in theory, last a long time. I say in theory because in practical terms, no one has actually solved the problem of how to sustain a dynamo for billions of years. But in theory, it could. However, it requires the core of the planet to be molten because you need currents of liquid metal moving around. Problem is Mercury uh, is too small for a dynamo to work. Move forward here a bit. As a small planet, its core should have frozen solid eons ago. That means that there can be no liquid motions inside the core, because the core is frozen, which means that a dynamo isn't an option to explain Mercury's field. Now, the other possible source for a magnetic field is called remnant magnetism. This is residual magnetism left over from the, from the planet's formation. This is, is also a viable explanation for what we see in Mercury. The problem is that remnant magnetism doesn't last very long. It de the field decays and goes away. So if you want to believe Mercury is old, you have to say remnant can't be the answer. It has to be a dynamo. But as we mentioned a moment ago, dynamo doesn't work because the core should be frozen. So if no dynamo, that implies what? The other explanation is true. Mercury's magnetism is remnant magnetism, but that would make it young and not old. This problem actually got worse for the secular side when the messenger mission recently discovered that not only does Mercury have a, a field, which the secular model implies it shouldn't, the field is also decaying. It loses half its energy about every 320 years or so. That again reinforces the idea this is not a dynamo that's sustaining this thing for billions of years. It's instead left over from the planet's formation, which apparently was very recent. 
And by the way, this is predicted by a Bible-believing physicist named Dr. Russell Humphreys in 1984, based on uh, some biblical texts where he made predictions about what planetary magnetic fields would look like. His predictions turned out to be right, and the secular model does not work. Moving outwards in the solar system, after Mercury we have Venus. Now Venus is a very thick atmosphere, uh, produces a massive greenhouse effect on the planet. It's actually hotter on Venus than it is on Mercury because of this. Think about 900 degrees or so Fahrenheit, hot enough to melt lead. Approaching 900 anyway. Uh, it's also 90 degrees of, atmos of atmospheric pressure, pardon me, not degrees, 90 atmospheres of pressure. So if you could visit Venus, which you shouldn't, um, you don't want to breathe the air because it's got sulfuric acid in it. Not that that would matter long anyway because you'd be crushed by the pressure or fried by the heat. Relevant thing to our topic tonight is that the atmosphere, being as thick as it is, is opaque. So we can't see the surface from here. However, we can send spacecraft and um, have done so. Turns out Venus' surface does not look like the product of billions of years of natural processes. The surface of this entire planet is actually young and fresh. It's apparently been globally resurfaced not that long ago by volcanic activity. In fact, a recent discovery of 37 volcanic structures that are apparently recently active, one of which at least, or at least one of which is apparently still cooling off. But this is interesting because there's no apparent source for the volcanism. On Earth, we get volcanic activity by plate tectonics, right? Plates moving around, banging into each other, subducting, and all the rest of it creates volcanoes. Venus doesn't have plate tectonics. Thus, there's no apparent source for energy to be driving volcanic activity for four and a half billion years. Yet it is still very hot. It looks like it was created not that long ago and is still cooling off from its formation. Venus is sometimes called our sister planet because it's about the same size and mass as Earth and is made up of roughly the same stuff. Therefore, if, if these objects came from the same natural processes, the same processes operating in the same place at the same time from the same materials, you would expect these planets to be very similar, at least in their major characteristics. But our planet has a moon, whereas Venus does not. Wouldn't you expect Venus to have a moon if having the moon is a natural outcome of these natural processes? Well, you would. So this creates a bit of a problem for secular modelers, and when there's a problem, you need a solution, which in this case is that Venus formed with the moon, as the model would imply, but then an asteroid crashed into the moon and destroyed it, and that's why it's not there today. So what's the evidence for this? Well, the fact that we don't see the moon there anymore. Is this good evidence? No. Moving onwards, we come to the planet Earth, uniquely designed for life, and we could spend a lot of time just on this fact alone. Um, a little bit, not outside of our topic, but there's other things I want to talk about here this evening. So we're going to move on from this point and just talk about a few characteristics of our home planet. Like our magnetic field. We've talked briefly about Mercury and how magnetic fields can have one of two sources, either a dynamo, which means it could be old, doesn't have to be, but could be, or remnant, residual, which means it would have to be young. Well, as I mentioned earlier, dynamos are actually really difficult things to sustain over long periods of time because they lose a lot of energy. And people have modeled a dynamo at the center of the Earth. This is, of course, the planet that we're most familiar with, and even with the Earth, dynamos have not turned out to work. Furthermore, it doesn't look like a dynamo anyway because it's decaying, just like Mercury's is. Our magnetic field is decreasing over time, which makes it look remnant and therefore young, not billions of years old. What do I mean by saying that it's young? Well, where does the magnetic field come from according to the dynamo theory itself? Well, magnetism is a result of currents moving around inside of the Earth. Those are, in fact, are in, um, furthermore driven by interior heat. So if the, our magnetic field is decreasing, which it is, it loses about half its energy every 1,400 years or so, if that means the magnetic field was higher in the past, which would mean there was more electric, stronger electric currents in the past, which would mean there was more interior heat in the past. So looking backwards into the past and doing some math, was there a maximum potential amount of heat that the Earth could have had? And you say, yes, there's a certain amount of heat that would ultimately melt the crust. And since that didn't happen, we know that it never was at that maximum. Looking backwards in time, if the, the field has been decreasing 
continually, which it appears they, to have been doing, then that maximum amount of heat sets a maximum strength for the magnetic field, which sets a maximum age for the magnetic field. Did everyone follow that? <laughs> I hope. Seeing current processes, looking backwards in time, sets a maximum age for the whole system of about 20,000 years. Now, I'm not saying it is 20,000 years. I think it's less than that, roughly 6,000. But the maximum will be 20, not 4.5 billion. Another feature of our planet is that it's covered with water. 70% or so of the surface of Earth is covered with water. Now, this is interesting because why are we on dry ground right now? If you think about a ball that, that could somehow attract water like gravity does, pour some water on it, the water's going to spread itself out evenly, right? There won't be any dry places. So why are we in a dry place? Because the surface of the Earth isn't even. The ocean basins are deep, so the water runs downhill. So the water is sitting in the oceans, and we're higher than the bottom of the ocean, thus we're dry and the oceans are wet. We'll, uh, we'll come back to this point in a minute. For now, let's focus uh, on the amount of water. If you could push the ocean basins up and squish the continents down so that it was a perfectly smooth ball, then the water would spread itself out evenly around the Earth. How deep would the ocean water be if it were evenly distributed around the whole Earth? The answer is about a mile and a half. There's a huge amount of water in the oceans. Note, by the way, there's more than enough to flood the entire planet if the topography of the Earth, the ocean basins, and the continents were just arranged a bit differently. So this is not a, a talk about a global flood in the past. Uh, I'm sure there's materials in the tables back there if this interests you. I'm just pointing out here, there's more than enough water in the oceans right now to flood the entire planet easily. So sometimes skeptics say, well, if there, was a, if there was a flood of Noah, where'd the water go? Go down to the ocean and look at it. It's still there. <laughs> Psalm 104 talks about the ocean basin sinking and the water is draining down into it. So apparently part of that flood process was the ocean basins being pushed up, perhaps by tectonic activity or whatever. My point is there's a lot of water here on Earth, just on the surface. Interesting, though, that the secular model says there isn't any. Water could not condense out of the solar nebula at our distance from the sun. It's too hot here. So the solar nebula model says the Earth is dry without water on it. That's not what we see. How do the secular scientists deal with this? Well, they have what's called a late veneer hypothesis that says the Earth formed dry, like the model said, and then later this veneer of water that we see today accumulated. Well, where did it accumulate from? Well, they used to say comets. Now, comets are big, dirty ice balls out in space. We'll talk more about them here in a bit. So the idea was the Earth was bombarded with hundreds of millions of comets after it formed, and that's where we got the water. Problem with that is we've been studying comets, taking samples even from some of them with spacecraft, which is a really cool technological feat if you think about it, bringing it back to Earth. It turns out there's some chemical differences between comet water and the Earth's ocean water. So the Earth's ocean water did not come from comets. That left secular modelers without a source for the Earth's water. This is a problem. When well, there's a problem, you need a solution. <laughs> now, it's not comets that gave us water, it's asteroids. How much water does an asteroid contain? <laughs> some, some do contain a little bit, but not a whole lot. There's also the issue, too, of once you have some water on Earth, are subsequent asteroid impacts going to add water, or are they going to vaporize whatever water is already there? This isn't a very good explanation, but it's the only one they have. There's more we could say about Earth if we had um, the inclination to do so, but let's move on and move our attention to our satellite, the Moon. The Moon is unique for many reasons, not the least of which is that it's the only other body than the Earth and people have walked on. So why did astronauts go and walk on it? Well, there were several goals for them to do that. One of the important goals, though, was to settle the debate over the Moon's origin. At the time of the Apollo program, back in the 60s and 70s, there were three major theories, three major secular theories, for where the moon came from. The fission theory, the nebula theory, and the capture theory. Fission theory said the moon split off from Earth a long time ago. Nebula said it, it formed in a cloud, the same as Earth did. Capture said it formed somewhere else, flew by and got captured gravitationally. All three of these theories, even back then, had problems. 
And it's interesting reading the debates at the time because an advocate of a particular theory didn't say, well, my theory is obviously superior because it has X, Y, and Z advantages. It was typically, well, your theory is obviously wrong because it has X, Y, Z problems. So there's a lot of finger pointing going on. All three of these theories have problems. Turned out the Apollo program actually just proved all three of them. The astronauts brought back several hundred pounds of samples with them, and analysis subsequently showed that for various reasons that I don't need to go into, all three of the theories were wrong. That left secular modelers without an explanation for the moon, this thing that we see in the sky. This is a problem. When well, there's a problem, you need a solution. Look this up nowadays, and you'll be told that early in Earth's history, a large object, a large asteroid the size of Mars struck the Earth, a lot of material blasted up into space, some of it came back down, but the rest of it started to orbit the Earth and formed into our moon. This is a very contrived solution. It requires an object of exactly the right size coming in at exactly the right speed at exactly the right angle. A lot of people are unhappy with it just for that reason. But subsequent investigation has shown other problems with it as well. For example, this is Harrison Schmidt, uh, who's not only an astronaut, but also a PhD geologist. Him and the other astronauts brought back a lot of samples, as I mentioned, including some volcanic soils, which you see him gathering here. And it turns out that inside some of these soils, we found water. This wasn't actually discovered back in the 70s. Um, it, there's not much water in the samples, I should make that clear, but there is some. Small enough that it was missed initially, but we have better lab gear now. So later, reinvestigation pointed out that indeed there is water in some of these samples. Now, the source of the soil samples is important. If there were water just on the moon's surface, that wouldn't necessarily be surprising, because maybe a comet hit the moon or whatever and added water to it. But the water that I'm talking about here was discovered in volcanic glass beads, little samples. So the volcanic glass came from inside the moon. Well, if the volcanic glass had water, that means there's water inside the moon. And water inside the moon is impossible according to this idea because had there been any water, it would have been vaporized by this catastrophe that supposedly happened. So this model says there can't be any water in the moon today because water would have been vaporized and lost in the collision. It wouldn't be there to uh, form into the moon. Nevertheless, we now know that there is water inside the moon. And later investigation, even after this initial discovery, has shown there's even more water in the moon than was thought at the time. Now it's understood that if you could bring all the water in the moon up to the surface, you'd be able to cover the entire moon with an ocean about one meter deep. So. On the Earth scale of water, that's not a large ocean, but in a moon that's supposed to not have any, this is a real issue, as even some secular scientists are starting to acknowledge now. Another question. Um, so number one, where it came from is a challenge from the secular side. Number two, how old is it? Well, there's been evidence for quite some time that the moon can't actually be very old. Going back a few centuries, actually, there had been these things called TLPs, which stands for transient lunar phenomena. There's been eyewitness accounts of temporary flashes and glows coming or being visible on the moon's surface. Apparently, uh, volcanic gas and other volcanic activity is kicking up dust and producing these events on the surface of the moon. They don't last long enough. They haven't lasted long enough to be photographed. But again, there's eyewitness accounts going back several hundred years. They was, those were mostly ignored, though. More recently, there's been evidence that's harder to ignore. For example, um, a scarp is basically a fault line on the surface that you see here. The moon has quite a few of these, and they are associated with tectonic activity of some kind. The moon, were it billions of years old, would have stopped tectonic activity long ago. It would have cooled off from its formation long ago. But recent discoveries are that there's some moonquakes associated with these scarps which means the moon is still tectonically active, which implies it's not very old because it hasn't had time to cool off from its formation yet. We also see a lot of wrinkle ridges. It appears the moon shrank as it cooled and produced these wrinkles, and this might still be going on today. There's been some fresh volcanic deposits discovered with more recent um, surveillance. Again, the moon should not be volcanically active anymore if it were four and a half billion years old. Apparently it is, though, which would imply it's not old after all. There's also this experiment here. The astronauts brought a lot of experiments 
uh, on their way to the moon, you see this piece of machinery back here. This is called an LLR device, Lunar Laser Ranging or Lunar Laser Re Reflector. Basically, it's a sophisticated mirror that'll bounce back anything, any light that shines on it. And several missions left these reflectors behind on the moon. Apollo 11, 14, and 15 each did that. And two uh, missions from the Soviet Union as well, Luna 17 and 21. And this allows scientists on Earth to fire a laser at the moon. And if you can hit one of the reflectors, which is challenging to do, as you can imagine, but it's possible, then the light bounces back to you, and you can measure how long it took the light to make that trip. That allows you to measure precisely how far away the moon was at the moment you did that. And over time, these measurements have shown, over the decades since Apollo, the moon is receding from the Earth. It's moving away slowly. Now, this actually wasn't a surprise. It was expected. What we didn't know was how quickly it was happening. Why was it expected? Well, because as the moon goes around the Earth, there's, of course, gravitational attraction between the Earth and moon. There's also gravitational attraction on the Earth's oceans, and the Earth's oceans bulge toward the moon as a result of that. That's what we experience as tides. However, the Earth rotates beneath the ocean bulge and pulls it forward a bit. That mass of ocean water then exerts its own gravitational attraction on the moon, which pulls it forward in its orbit a little bit, and which adds energy to the orbit, and thus the moon is moving away slightly over time. So what do I mean by slightly over time? We're talking about a few centimeters a year. It's about an inch and a half. Now, that's not much. But if you do the math, looking backwards in time, because this is a result of gravitational attraction, the effect would have been stronger in the past. This is not a linear process. So looking backwards in time and we're doing the math, if the moon is moving away today, that means it would have been closer in the past. It turns out the moon would have been touching the Earth just one and a half billion years ago. Now, no one believes that the moon was ever touching the Earth. Um, and I'm not saying the moon is one and a half billion years old. I'm saying that's the maximum age. 6,000 years works just fine, too. What doesn't work is four and a half billion because of this process that we see going on. Now, the secular side has explanations for how things used to be different in the past, and so the recession rate was different, et cetera. Uh, there's a lot of modeling going on, but there's no real evidence to back that up. The system that we see today has the recession rate that we see today, and that's what it implies, that the moon can't be four and a half billion years old after all. There's more we could say about the moon, but let's move outwards to the planet Mars. Mars is sometimes called the red planet. It's a desert. The entire planet's a desert. Nevertheless, though, if you follow science news, you'll probably frequently have heard about all this evidence for water that keeps getting discovered on Mars. Now, it's possible that some of these formations were produced by water. It's also possible they were produced by wind erosion or some other um, processes. But we are told that this evidence implies necessarily large oceans on Mars in the planet's past. Now, this isn't necessarily true. Even the features that do appear to have been formed by water might have been formed in other ways than an ocean. For example, Mars has a lot of ice at its poles, and in some places there's ice beneath the surface as well. If there's volcanic activity, it could melt the ice into liquid water. That liquid water can then form channels and form erosional features and so on. This is one possibility for how these features could have formed. Nevertheless, we are told large oceans is the preferred explanation. Why is that? Well, typically, a secular modeler wants to believe that life formed on Earth by natural processes and wants to find evidence of that happening somewhere else, too, because that would, they think that would help them explain how life formed here, but it actually doesn't, setting that aside. In order for life to have formed somewhere else, they need water to do it. Thus, there is a large motivation, if you will, for there to have been oceans of water on Mars in the past. The problem, though, is that Mars doesn't look like a planet that can support oceans of water. For one thing, it has a very thin atmosphere, which means the boiling point of water is very low. Even though it's very cold on Mars, if you poured out a pitcher of water, it would evaporate away and boil away very quickly. So even if you add liquid water to the surface, it's not going to stay on the surface. It's going to boil away and be lost. So on a desert planet, with an atmosphere that makes it impossible to retain liquid water for long, 
how can there be an ocean there? How could there have been an ocean there? Well, this creates a problem. Well, there's a problem, you need a solution. So the solution is that Mars used to have a thicker atmosphere which would allow the planet to sustain an ocean for millions of years, but then an asteroid came in, hit the planet, disrupted it, disrupted the magnetic field, magnetic field went away, so the atmosphere was lost, and that's what we see today. Where's the evidence for this? Well, you can probably guess what my answer to that would be. But there's an aspect of this that I find interesting. So here's the Earth and here's Mars. This is not to scale, by the way. Mars is smaller than the Earth. The Earth is a planet covered with liquid water. In fact, there's so much water, as I said, that it would cover the whole planet a mile and a half deep if the, if the oceans were shallower and the continents were lower. Yet we are told that the idea of a global flood having happened here on Earth is ridiculous. But Mars, a desert planet, where it's physically impossible to have an ocean of water, we are told that did have large oceans for millions of years. Does anybody see some inconsistency going on here? There's more we can say about Mars, but that brings us to the end of our time with the terrestrial planets here this evening. Mercury, Venus, Earth, and Mars. Now we're going to move farther out in the solar system and talk about the gas giants, Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus, and Neptune, all of which are giants, as you can see, to scale with the Earth here. These are very large planets. The largest of which is the planet Jupiter, sometimes called the king of the planets. Beautiful formations on the surface, including this famous one called the giant red spot. This is a storm system that's been on Jupiter for as long as we've had telescopes to see it, so several hundred years at least. Maybe it's been there since it was created, for all we know. This one storm system alone is bigger than the Earth. Imagine a hurricane bigger than the Earth. How violent would that be? Jupiter is very impressive in the storm systems and other things it has going on. However, there's a benevolent side to Jupiter. Jupiter actually protects the Earth from impacts coming in from space. What I'm showing you here is a scar from where a piece of a comet hit Jupiter a few years ago. Turns out that Jupiter is large enough and is in its posi position in the solar system is such that its gravity will actually attract things that otherwise might hit the Earth. Some people have even argued that were Jupiter not there doing that for us, life here would not be possible. Jupiter's not only protective, it also is beautiful. When you see uh, close-up pictures and all these formations. This is, of course, a subjective thing. We can't quantify that. So this in itself doesn't create any challenges for secular modelers. However, other discoveries have. For example, the secular model says that Jupiter formed from gas into dust, into rocks, into asteroids. Then the asteroids, in Jupiter's case, supposedly made a solid core and then as it traveled through the gas cloud, attracted gas to itself via gravity and built this giant planet from the gas cloud. So the secular model predicts that inside of Jupiter, there should be this solid core left over from this process that gathered all together the rest of it. The problem is the Juno mission found that this is not what is inside of Jupiter. Jupiter does not have a solid rocky core. Jupiter has what's being called a fuzzy core. It's, it, basically, it's sludge. So this thick sludge in the middle, and then it kind of blends into the atmosphere. Secular model says Jupiter can't have formed this way. But here it is. This creates a problem. When there's a problem, you need a solution. So the solution is that Jupiter formed with a solid core, as the secular model predicts. But then an asteroid came in, penetrated the planet, hit the core exactly in the middle, at exactly the right angle, exactly the right speed, broke it up, and formed this dispersed core that we see today. What an amazing coincidence that was. <laughs> now, nobody aimed it, but somehow it did that. Jupiter also has what's called the migration problem. As these planets were supposedly forming in this cloud of gas, remember, they're moving through a cloud of gas. What happens when you move through something thick? Well, that slows you down. Not that the gas cloud was all that thick necessarily, but it certainly wasn't the vacuum of space. When you slow down, you lose energy. And the way orbits work is when you lose energy, you move inward toward the thing you're orbiting. Turns out that the theory says, when you actually do the math, Jupiter would have lost enough energy as it was trying to gather itself together into a planet that it would have migrated all the way in 
to the sun. As this uh, press release from astronomy and astrophysics pointed out, theories predict that the giant protoplanets, meaning the planets that are forming, will merge into the central star, that's a nice way of saying crash into the sun, before the planets have time to form. This makes it very difficult to understand how they can form at all. Understanding the formation of giant planets is currently one of the major challenges for astronomers. Well, it's more than a major challenge. The model says the planet shouldn't be there, but it is there nonetheless. There's more we could say about Jupiter, but let's focus our attention on one of its moons here, Io. Io is a very interesting little moon. It's not very big. It's sometimes called the pizza moon because it has this very interesting appearance to it. It's actually the most volcanically active body in the solar system. Now, why is that? Well, part of the reason is because Io is caught in a gravitational tug of war between Jupiter on one side, which is a large planet, lots of gravity, and some of the other moons of Jupiter on the other side. So there's squeezing and flexing is imparting geological energy into this moon. However, Io has eruptions that are much more violent than that process could explain. Io has been seen blasting material 180 miles into space. At any one point we've had, uh, at any one point that we've had spacecraft visiting, there's always been active volcanic eruptions going off. Again, Io is very volcanically active. This makes it look very young. This gravita these tidal flexing that we talked about, the squeezing and flexing from gravity, that can only account for a small fraction of the amount of heat necessary to drive all of this volcanic activity on Io. In fact, there's so much material coming out of Io's volcanoes that if it were three, to, excuse me, if it were actually four and a half billion years old, it would have recycled itself through its own volcanoes over 30 times. Does that sound feasible? There's also the fact that with material this hot being blasted out through eruptions and all the rest of it, over time, you would have high density materials settle down and low density materials work their way to the top. Io hasn't done that yet. It should have a low density crust by now, but it doesn't. All of this makes Io look very young, not billions of years old. And there's other interesting moons of Jupiter, but tonight we're gonna to move on and talk a bit about Saturn. Saturn, of course, is famous for its beautiful rings. The rings look like solid things, but they're not. They're actually belts of particles all orbiting Saturn together. The particles range from little specks up to boulders the size of houses, more or less. So this is what the rings are. Now, the rings were supposed to have formed when Saturn did four and a half billion years ago. But the Cassini mission and other investigation has shown that the rings actually have to be young. For one thing, the rings darken over time. As Saturn moves through space, it's picking up material. The rings would absorb that material and get darker, but they're still very bright. They're mostly water ice, by the way. So the fact that they're bright tells us they're young. Also the fact too, Cassini found that there's a, a large amount of what's called ring rain. The particles from the rings are raining down onto, onto Saturn's surface. The rings are decaying. They're going away. They're not gonna be there for billions of years. Well, if you're a secular modeler, you want to be able to explain what we see, right? So you have a bit of a problem here with the rings having to be young. And when there's a problem, you need a solution in that the rings didn't form when Saturn did. They actually formed much more recently when an asteroid hit one of Saturn's moons and destroyed it and so on. This isn't really all that good of an explanation either because as I mentioned, Saturn's rings are mostly water ice. Uh, so you would need moon, moons or asteroids composed of that. Moving onwards, we see Saturn, of course, is famous for its beauty. Again, a subjective thing, but it's worth noting. A non-subjective thing is physics, which Saturn has the same issue with that Jupiter does. Had Saturn and Jupiter formed from a cloud of gas billions of years ago, they would have migrated into the sun before they could finish forming, which means just like Jupiter, Saturn shouldn't be there either, but it is. Saturn has dozens of moons, uh, some more of which were just discovered a few days ago, for that matter. Um, I'm going to talk about just one tonight, which is Enceladus, a pretty little moon here, as you can see. It's actually the brightest object in the solar system. It reflects almost all of the sunlight it receives back into space. Now, Enceladus was intriguing. Our first photographs of it were interesting. 
This is a, these are Saturn's rings here. You're look, the spacecraft was almost edge on. This is Enceladus, and it's probably kind of hard to see, but you may be able to see a little smudge beneath this moon. Why would a moon have a smudge in the picture? Here's another picture. You see there's something going on here. Turns out Enceladus has geysers of water and ice shooting out of its south pole area at about 800 miles per hour. Now, why would a moon have a fountain on it? Well, apparently there's water inside and it's being boiled and it's shooting out of cracks that we see in the southern part of this moon. That requires a lot of energy, right? In fact, some of, the, some of Enceladus' neighboring moons are wider than they otherwise should be because this moon is spray painting them with water and snow. This requires a lot of energy to produce this type of activity. The problem is Enceladus is small and it should have cooled off from its formation billions of years ago had it actually formed billions of years ago. It's supposed to be far too old to be geologically active, but it is geologically active and very much so. Now, if you look this up, you'll be told that Enceladus has the tidal flexing going on, same as Io, but that's le that explains less than 10% of the energy that's required for this. And there's a lot of head scratching going on. Enceladus shouldn't be doing this. It's too old to be doing this, but it is doing that. Apparently it's not actually old. Moving outwards in the solar system, we come to the planet Uranus, which doesn't look all that exciting at first. It's a kind of a nondescript bluish greenish ball, as you can see here. Therefore, it was a surprise when our spacecraft reached it for the first time and got better measurements of it and found out that it, when false colors are added, you can see, doesn't have a North Pole here and a South Pole here like um, the other planets do. Instead, its poles are at the side. So there's a pole sticking out here, and then the other poles on the far side of the moon, uh, excuse me, far side of the planet. Did I say moon earlier? Pardon me. Far side of the planet. Um, and so that raises the question, is this the North Pole or the South Pole? <laughs> if it's sticking out the side. So whereas the other planets rotate like tops, they spin like tops as they go around the sun, Uranus rolls along sideways like a ball. Now the secular model says it shouldn't be doing that because this swirling cloud of gas and dust should have produced spinning planets this way, not rolling planets that way. So the secular model says that Uranus shouldn't have formed this way. So this is, of course, is a problem. When there's a problem, you need a solution. <laughs> Uranus formed the right way up, so we are told, and then an asteroid the size of the Earth crashed into it and knocked it over. A couple of problems with that, though. Number one, Uranus's orbit is almost perfectly circular. Doesn't look like it got hit by something large. Number two, Uranus has a nice system of moons orbiting it in its sideways orientation. And explaining that uh, system of moons in the context of a catastrophe having happened has been very challenging for secular modelers. And I can't resist talking about one of these moons specifically, which is Miranda. Miranda's a tiny little moon. It's only about 300 miles across but it's one of the strangest objects in the solar system. I mean, how many different kinds of terrain can you see on just this one tiny little thing? You've got groove terrain here. You've got ridges down here, smoother terrain here, still cratered. And then you have a big check mark right in the middle of it all. <laughs> Notice how distinct the boundaries are between some of these areas of topography. It almost looks like someone took a big paintbrush and swiped it across the surface. Miranda also has the highest clip in the solar system, 12 miles high. Imagine standing at the top and looking down. So would you like to be a secular modeler who has to try to explain how this thing formed by natural processes? I mean, it looks like a patchwork quilt. Miranda is a real problem for the modelers. And what is a problem you need, say it with me now, a solution, yep. Miranda formed looking more like a typical moon, so we are told, and then an asteroid came along, crashed into it, broke it up into pieces, and the pieces reassembled into this weird looking critter that we have today. Other modelers point out though that, number one, Miranda's topography probably wouldn't survive a collision. You wouldn't see these kind of cliffs and such afterward. Other modelers point out that one collision isn't enough. 
NASA used to have a web page that said five collisions happened in a row. Collision, breakup, reassemble, collision, breakup, reassemble, five times sequentially. We'll leave it to you to decide how good of a scientific approach that is. Moving outwards in the solar system, we have the planet Neptune. Now, Neptune is the farthest planet from the sun, doesn't receive much energy from the sun as a result, and is supposed to be four and a half billion years old, so therefore, Neptune, sh Neptune should be old, cold, and dead. Turns out it's none of the above. Neptune is not dead. It's a very dynamic planet. After the Voyager missions, we've been watching it with Hubble and other instruments and seeing a lot of large storm systems come and go. Neptune is a very dynamic, changing place. It also has the strongest winds in the solar system, almost 1,300 miles an hour, yet receives little energy from the sun to account for any of this activity. But perhaps the biggest problem that Neptune poses for secular modelers is that it, along with Uranus, doesn't actually exist. As this article in Astronomy Magazine pointed out, pst, astronomers who model the formation of the solar system have kept a dirty little secret. Uranus and Neptune don't exist. Or at least computer simulations have never explained how planets as big as the two gas giants could form so far from the sun. This author said, it's clear that our level of sophistication of studying planet formation is relatively primitive. So far, it's been very difficult for anybody to come up with a scenario that actually produces Uranus and Neptune. I won't bore you with details, but that model of getting planets from rocks, which came from dust, which came from gas, can't produce planets out where Uranus and Neptune are in any reasonable amount of time. It would need longer than the age of the solar system. So even according to their model, with four and a half billion years to work with, they can't explain how many planets could be out there. Yet, they are there nonetheless, even though the model says they shouldn't be. Earlier I mentioned I would talk about Pluto. Hard to resist talking about Pluto as a planet because old habits die hard, but officially it's now a dwarf planet. And the New Horizons spacecraft discovered some really interesting things about this little world. Very surprising things from the secular perspective. First of all, there's large areas of smooth, craterless terrain. What does craterless tell us about the age of this terrain? It has to be very young because there hasn't been time for anything to hit it and form new craters. I mean, it could have formed the day before the spacecraft got there for all we can tell. And this isn't an isolated uh, instance. Large amounts of Pluto's surface are like this. Apparently it's been reworked. There are craters over here and then none here and then there's this uh, transition in the middle. It looks like there used to be some craters over here and then volcanic activity of some sort is flooding the surface with this material, which is, has flowed out, filled in all these craters and comes over to here. Well, volcanic activity means there's gotta be some source of heat inside of this body. But there's no obvious explanation or no source for this heat under the secular model. There's only um, three possible explanations for large amounts of heat inside of a world like this. You can have radioactive decay of elements inside of it. You can have tidal heating, that flexing and squeezing from gravity that we talked about. Or you can have primordial heat, heat left over from the formation of the body. Pluto, it turns out, can't have radioactive decay as a significant source of heat because it's not very dense as a body, which means there's not much heavy stuff in it and radioactive elements are heavy. So we know there's not much radioactive elements, which means there's not much radioactive decay, which means that's not a valid source of heat. There's also no source of tidal heating to keep squeezing it and flexing it. So the only possible source for Pluto's heat is primordial heat left over from its creation. Now, if that creation happened just 6,000 years ago, that's not a problem. Pluto could still be cooling off from its formation, which happened recently. If you want to believe it's four and a half billion years old, though, then you have a serious challenge trying to explain what's going on here. We'll also talk briefly here tonight about comets, which of course are not planets or moons or whatever. They're much smaller, but they're, they can also be very interesting. Um, sometimes they show up as spectacular sights in the night sky. Sometimes they're good, sometimes they're not. Depends on how close they are and some other factors. But what is a comet? Well, look, as I mentioned earlier, a comet is basically a big dirty snowball in space. 
This is the Vilt 2 comet. It's about three miles across, so that gives you an indication of how big these things are. And for most of its time, a comet is not very interesting. They're dark, they're small, and they don't produce any light of their own. So most of the time, we can't see them. However, as they approach the sun, they begin to warm up, and the ices within them begin to sublimate into gas. The gas then jets out and produces the tail uh, that we, if we're lucky, can see from Earth as a nice, beautiful comet. However, the, the point is, every time the comet approaches the sun, it loses material. That means every comet you see is doomed. It is going to be destroyed eventually. A comet can only visit the sun so many times before it breaks up into pieces, and we've actually seen this happen with multiple comets now, like the example I'm showing you here. You can calculate how long it takes for a comet to be destroyed, how, man, how many times it, it can visit the sun before it's gone. Uh, some e evade this fate, by the way, but only because they crash into a planet first or they get flung out of the solar system um, by gravitational interaction with something. Either way, regardless of which fate it has, a comet's lifespan, if I can use that word, is limited. And there's a group of comets specifically called short period comets that have smaller orbits and they visit the sun frequently. That means they have smaller lifespans. And it's been calculated that short period comets, the maximum lifespan is 100,000 years or less. There's a few that may be more. There's a lot, mo a lot of other comets where we're talking 10,000 years with the maximum. The point is none of them can last millions or billions of years. Now this is in interesting because the secular model says comets must have formed at the beginning of the solar system's history. The secular model can't produce them any later than that. So if they've been around since the beginning and they would all be gone after 100,000 years, that puts a maximum age of 100,000 years for the solar system itself, doesn't it? So these are a good testament to a recent creation. And later work has actually in, uh, revealed something else very interesting. Comets are not only way out there as we previously thought. The last few years uh, have been punctuated by discoveries of what are called active asteroids where we're seeing asteroids in the asteroid belt that are displaying cometary behavior. Now remember, asteroids are supposed to be big chunks of rock, and most of them are. It turns out not all of them are, though. Why is this significant? Because the asteroid belt is fairly close to the sun. Almost all the asteroids are in between Mars and Jupiter. So they've been receiving energy from the sun for as long as the solar system has, has existed, apparently, and we're watching some of these break apart. Some of them are rocky, as I said. Some of them are actually apparently icy bodies, though, which would mean they're comets. But comets can't survive this close to the sun for long. In fact, uh, this one specifically, you know, so what, what is it that breaks a, a comet uh, apart? There's a couple possible scenarios. The most common explanation is that sunlight uh, is heating these things unevenly because there's only one side facing the sun, obviously, right? So one side gets hot, the other does not. As the comet radiates the heat back outward, it, it imparts a spin, and then that spin results in the comet breaking itself up into pieces. So let's think about this. If these things are so delicate that they can be destroyed by sunshine, how are they gonna last billions of years? Yet we're seeing them there today. They are still there today. Some of them, as I said, are being observed as they are breaking apart. Does it make more sense that th these are very young objects? Again, indicating a young age for the solar system overall. So in our time here tonight, we've talked about the solar system. We've asked the question, where did it come from? We've contrasted what we see with the solar nebula model, which is the idea that it came from a cloud of gas and dust and so on. And we've taken the approach of looking at each object and saying, well, how could we tell where it came from? Does each object look consistent with this model or not? Does it look like it's the product of random processes or not? And this is something I didn't have much time to talk about tonight, by the way. There's design and fine tuning arguments you could get from a lot of the planets in the solar system. Things that don't make sense as the result of random processes. And do they look billions of years old? Or are there very good reasons to believe that these objects are actually much younger than secular scientists would say?
They also give us an interesting perspective on scientific truth. And I'm putting truth in quotes because scientific proclamations, if I can use that word, change frequently, right? If you follow the, the news, you'll sometimes hear, uh, quite frequently here actually, we need to rewrite the textbooks as a result of this new discovery. Yet before that discovery, you would have been told that you were a science denier if you didn't accept that current version of what was being taught as truth. For the solar system specifically, tonight we've seen, as one of my astrophysics textbooks points out, thus far we have seen that we know very little about the development of the solar system. There is a lot about the solar system that is not consistent with the idea of natural processes operating over billions of years. And that's not really surprising to us because the solar system is not the result of natural processes operating over billions of years. As the Bible tells us, the heavens declared the glory of God and the firmament shows his handiwork. They're the result of his creative work, his design, his appreciation for beauty and other things. And when looked at it in that light, a lot of this becomes clear. So if you like this type of perspective on astronomy, you probably, <laughs> not surprising you won't get this uh, from the secular media, right? I have a website called creationastronomy.com where we talk about these sorts of things. Uh, there's a free email newsletter available there. Uh, it only comes out a few times a year at this point. I'm trying to get better at that. But you won't be spammed, is my point. Were you to sign up, you'd receive only a few of these per year. But as, as new discoveries are made, new announcements happen in astronomy, uh, I'll write an article and then post it out to the newsletter. Also available there, and in the back of the room actually, is the video set that um, Heinz mentioned. What you saw tonight was excerpted from the first of the three videos. Um, the entire video is only on the solar system. In fact, what you heard tonight was less than half of the full presentation. So there's a lot more where this came from, a lot more information about design, fine-tuning that I didn't talk about tonight, more evidence for youth, and so on. And same, same approach in that video as you saw tonight, we go through each of the planets, we talk about their characteristics, including Pluto. <laughs> and a uh, two-disc two disc set, because it didn't all fit on one disc. So lots of good stuff. If you like what you heard tonight, I uh, recommend that to you. Volume two in the series uh, applies that same perspective to stars and galaxies. What can we understand about how they formed? Did they form naturally over billions of years or did they look young and created? Is there evidence for design in our sun? That's something you don't often hear about, but yes, there's a lot of evidence that the sun is finely tuned and designed. Where do stars come from? Can they form by natural processes? What about galaxies? Where do they come from? That's the subject of volume two. Volume three then expands the perspective out to the entire universe. What is the origin of our cosmos? Do the heavens declare that the Big Bang happened? No. Heavens declare the glory of their creator. So the Big Bang model is the subject of volume three. Uh, you'll see that the laws of physics themselves actually show that a supernatural creator has to be responsible for the origin of our universe. Because indeed the entire universe declares the glory of God. And it is our privilege to try to catch a, a glimpse of his glory through that. We can't comprehend it fully, but in his grace he's made it available to us to appreciate and glorify him through that. There's my site again. This brings me to the end of my prepared material, and I believe we have time for questions now. Thank you, Spike. And thank you all for your attention. That was a lot of information, but you only heard a small part of it, what to say about that. He will, he will be talking on a different topic tomorrow night, which has... Um, you know, something to do uh, with the origin and how we see the distant uh, uh, objects. If the Earth is, is young, how do, how do we explain the distant objects? So that is tomorrow night. So if you have a question, come on, uh, put up your hand, and I'll bring around the, the mic so we can capture both the question and the answer. I'm still trying to formulate the question in my mind, but it has to do with the planets all look like they're perfect balance spheres. Mm -hmm. How does that happen naturally? They're not perfectly spherical. Uh, like the Earth, for example, bulges out at the equator because of a rotation. Uh, the thought is, if you have enough material 
then it will self-gravitate and become a body. And above about, if you have enough material to make a body of more than 300 miles or so, then there's enough material to produce enough gravity to squeeze it together and it'll form a ball shape. So that's why a lot of the asteroids, for example, are not spherical. They look like peanuts or potatoes or whatever because there's not enough stuff there to pull it together uh, into a, a spherical shape. You know, if you, a sphere is the shape where, that minimizes the distance of any particle to the center of, of the object. So if there's enough stuff, then there's enough gravity to squeeze it together like that. Um, smaller bodies won't have that happen. This, of course, assumes that there's time for all this to have happened on its own. Um, I'm just pointing out that even under a long age viewpoint, um, there's an explanation for why we see what we see. Does that answer your question? Okay. 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 Question over here. Yes. Behind the post. Um, did you say how Pluto actually fell over? Kind of. Pluto fell over. Oh, I see. Um, you. you, you <laughs> the, I was just showing a gra The graphic showed all the planets lined up. Yeah, uh, Pluto was, in that graphic years ago when they first made that picture, they had Pluto lined up with all the others. And then when they decided that Pluto couldn't be called the planet anymore, they moved it down to the bottom of the picture. But that, that was just how the picture was arranged. In, in the actual solar system, if this is the sun, all the planets orbit in a disk shape, right? Called the planet the ecliptic. Pluto does not. Pluto is offset by about 17 degrees, if I remember correctly. So um, Pluto doesn't, wouldn't really belong in a lined up graphic anyway, if they're trying to be accurate about it. Um, you, you said it wrong? Oh, what were you asking about? Um, Uranus, maybe? Uh, well, uh, see, I, that's the one that some people say was knocked over. But I, I'm pointing out maybe it was created that way. Because if, if you want to say it was it, this way and then something knocked it over, uh, you have to explain how it got knocked over and still preserve all the moons and, and some other th things that don't fit that idea. So I believe the Lord created it that way, just as a means of puzzling and delighting us and maybe causing some head scratching for people who don't want to accept his handiwork. Other questions? Yeah, I see one hand over here. Raise your hand up, and so it gives me time to run over to you. What is the gravitational pull of Mercury? The gravitational pull of Mercury? Uh, off the top of my head, I don't know. It, it would be much less than the Earth because it's much smaller than the Earth. Um, so it will have some, but not, not much. There are actually moons that are bigger than Mercury. Ganymede, in, uh, the moon of Jupiter, and Titan, the moon of Saturn, are both bigger than the planet Mercury. So. With the James Webb Space Telescope that's out there right now, what kind of things have they seen within our own solar system? And can that be used um, in that way? It's, it's designed to be looking outwards rather than in. I'm not, a, I'm not aware that they've used it for anything within the solar system yet. Uh, maybe they have, and I'm just not aware of it. The, there have been some other interesting discoveries, um, some really interesting discoveries. Um, can I kick? You will address tomorrow night, right? In your time. Uh, no, this? actually, no. Oh, okay. uh, what are these can, can I take like a four minute rabbit trail, Heinz? Uh, yeah, just okay. a few minutes. So. I, I talk about this in my second DVD on stars and galaxies. Um, the secular model says that stars formed and then g they gather together into galaxies and then galaxies themselves will change over time. Um, they'll start out in this shape and then they'll evolve, if you will, into a, an, another shape. Hubble was looking fairly deep into the cosmos already, even before James Webb was launched. The secular folks expected that as we're looking farther out into space, we're looking backwards in time, because the light took so long to get here, so we're seeing these objects as they used to be billions of years ago. Initially, it was expected, based on their models, galaxies would need a, a several 
billion years to form and become mature. So at a certain point, as we look farther out, we should start seeing immature galaxies in the process of forming. Hubble wasn't finding those. We were seeing mature galaxies where there shouldn't be any farther and farther back. Uh, and that was already a challenge just with Hubble's capabilities. However, there were some of the farthest ones where they said, you know, we're seeing mature ones that we didn't expect, but there's still a lot, a high percentage of immature ones. So it's a problem, but it's not, you know, but we'll still reassure ourselves that, you know, we'll, we'll figure it out. James Webb now is looking further out than Hubble can and getting a clearer view of, of things Hubble could already see. So first of all, James Webb is looking farther out and still finding large, mature galaxies where there shouldn't be any. I mean, stars weren't even supposed to be forming yet. We're talking like 250 million years after the alleged Big Bang. There shouldn't be stars yet, but not only are there stars, they've already gathered themselves into large, mature galaxies. So this is an exacerbation, a worsening of the problem that Hubble found. Furthermore, some of the closer regions where Hubble had seen a higher percentage of immature ones, now that we get better look, we're finding, I shouldn't say we, um, they've been finding mature galaxies that were too dim for Hubble to notice. So not only is it finding evidence, galaxies where there shouldn't be any, also some of the evidence that they thought was reassuring turns out to not be so good because James Webb has a better view of it and so that high percentage of immature has gone down. So yeah, James Webb, is, it's, it's only been um, active for, um, operational for a few months and there's, there's good stuff coming out of it. Which again confirms that science is not ever settled. It's always right. finding out new things. And, right. Yeah. You mentioned when you were talking about Mercury that there's ice on Mercury. And I thought because it was so close to the sun, there would be no way that there'd be any kind of ice. I did, not ice, volatile elements. Okay. Like sulfur and potassium. I, I didn't say ice. There is possible evidence for ice at the bottom of some of the craters. Um, now that would be in permanent shadow. So maybe you could say it would last, although there's issues with that. Um, but that, that's not a, um, that's an issue, but it's not one of the, the, the bigger issues. So in my time tonight, I tried to just focus on the, on the biggest problems. Yes. Um, in your research, so you were an atheist evolutionist, correct? Yes. What was that point where you, was it the culmination of everything that you studied that transitioned your beliefs and seeing God and his creation, or was there a moment? I'm just curious. It was a process. Um, it began by me finding out that a coworker was not only a Christian, but also a creationist. And I was taken aback. I mean, he's there working with us. He's obviously an intelligent guy. How can he believe that? Um, and so I asked him, how do you deny all the obvious evidence for evolution? And he said, what obvious evidence is that? And so I started talking about fossil sequences and radiometric dating and all of this other stuff. And I, I should mention too that I've been marinating in science since I was a kid. I was gonna be a paleontologist until I was a teenager and discovered that paleontologists don't make any money. <laughs> and then I was offered an engineering scholarship, so I said, okay, I'll go take the scholarship. Um, so I knew geology, paleontology fairly well, at least from a lay perspective. Uh, and then in university, my interest shifted to the sky. So uh, ground to sky, I thought I had the evolutionary story down. And so I started challenging my friend and all these things that I thought supported my view, and he shot it all down. Uh, he's very much into apologetics and very well informed on these sorts of things. I didn't, at the time, I didn't know that. We were just having a conversation. So first months over lunch and stuff as we were talking, I'd, what about, I'd ask him, what about such and such? He'd say, oh, you should look into that. They threw that one out a, a couple of years ago. I go look and sure enough, he's right. So I kept asking him, he kept answering, and I eventually ran out of things to ask. And he noticed and he said, okay, well, I've answered your questions, yeah, you can answer mine. I said, oh, that's fair. And he said, you believe in the laws of physics, don't you? I said, well, yeah, we use them here every day. He said, how do you reconcile those with the Big Bang model? And he didn't even explain what he, what he meant. And so I thought about the question, I realized, wait a minute, Big Bang actually violates some really important physics. In fact, they don't get along at all. Uh, and that's where it got... That's where, that, I guess that was the, the point where it changed from a fun game of finding a problem with him to me realizing I have a problem with me. 
And so I got to fix this because I apparently believe contradictory things at the same time. So I start going through my textbooks and trying to find answers for some of this, and all of these problems start appearing in the reasoning. And I say, okay, so here's math, here's math, here's hand waving, here's where the miracle happened, and then here's more math. I say, wait a minute, you know, we, we can't. And the more I dug, the worse it got. And I'm like, what happened to my textbooks? They were fine a couple years ago. <laughs> <laughs> um, but once you start questioning assumptions, it's like, well, wait a minute, what justifies making that statement? Where did you get that from? That's where a lot of this stuff comes from. So I'm simultaneously realizing that my foundation is much shakier than I thought. Uh, and then he starts bringing in apologetics books for me to read, in including stuff on the historicity of the biblical text and a lot of other stuff that I had never heard of before. And I didn't want any of this to be true, by the way. I was trying to disprove his belief system. Um, but I, I, I started going through all the sciences I could. Okay, so maybe astronomy you know, isn't a good thing to talk about. Let's, talk, let's shift to biology. We've got neo-Darwinian processes and all the rest of it. And the deeper I dug, and it got worse and worse. <laughs> until I, I got to a point, I was like, I got nowhere else to go. You know, I'm, I'm a rat trapped in the corner. <laughs> um, the evidence points this way. I thought it was that way. But now, what do I do? I don't want it to point that way, because that means there's a creator. That means I'm accountable to somebody. I, I realized very clearly that, that that was the implication of it. But I can't deny what the evidence says, because that's what it says. So I'm either intellectually dishonest and deny what the evidence is, which is what I've thought I've been about my whole life, or I go down this path I don't want to go. And I rejected both of them. I said, I'll just sit here and pout. <laughs> <laughs> so for a couple weeks, I didn't have a worldview, and I knew it, and it was terrible. Um, <laughs> but I didn't have any good options. They were all bad. Until it finally dawned on me, say, hey, wait a minute, stupid. The gospel message that you heard at 12 years old and rejected because science showed there was no global flood. Yes, God knows your sin, knows it better than you do. But if creation's true and the Bible's true, then the gospel is true too. God loves you despite your sin. Enough to send his son to pay for it all. So it's like, why am I fighting this? So in a sense, I became a creationist before I became a Christian, which I often say at the beginning of my talks. Um, often creationists are portrayed as, well, you're pre-committed to the Bible, and so you put these blinders on to any, any evidence that disproves your view. No, I'm one of many whom the opposite was true. The evidence brought me to a point first, and then said, okay, well, what does that mean? Now, creation is not sufficient to make one a Christian, obviously. I mean, there's Muslims uh, who believe in creation. But for many, science is their stumbling block. That's how, that's how I was, and so that's why I, I do this, is maybe help others see things from a different perspective. Okay. I another, hope that answered your question. No, another question. What do you say to all the recent talk about UFOs? They seem to have come back into the news uh, a lot lately. Lord willing, that will be volume five in this series. Um, Briefly, well, this is going to be two parts. Number one, what about exoplanets, all these other planets we're discovering? There's some interesting science going on there, calling back to the solar nebula model and producing even worse problems for that than we already knew about. Um, but the question is, is there life elsewhere? I would say maybe. I don't, I don't see that there's a problem with the, the Lord can create life wherever he wants. I don't think he created intelligent life anywhere else because that creates theological issues. If there's intelligent aliens that he created somewhere else, did he create them sinless or sinful? Apparently sinless because when Adam was, was created, the universe wasn't tainted by sin yet. That means they were caught up in the curse that they didn't participate in or that it wasn't their fault. So that's unjust. Adam sinned, you know, Romans says the universe is cursed as a result of that. So they were living in a universe that got cursed as a result of mankind sinned, which doesn't seem fair. But if they were sinful, then, well, then sin already existed and, you know, all the rest of it. Um, so there's theological issues with intelligent beings being created outside of humanity. Maybe there's life on other planets, but it'd be interesting if we find something. But it would have to be created there because life doesn't form on its own. That's a whole different subject. I mean, chemistry doesn't, doesn't support that idea. So how do you explain the phenomena of visitations and all the rest of it? And I, I have a personal connection with this because the very first alien ab abductee was my mailman in New Hampshire. <laughs> 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 yeah. Now, I was in diapers. I'd never met the man, but 
but that, that, that's my claim to a connection with alien abductions. Um, the, I have, a, I have a, a book from the Time Life series on the occult that I think is really interesting. It talks about all the various things that these people experience um, being taken and various things being done to them and shows how similar things were reported in the Middle Ages and medieval times. Um, very, very similar things. And they said, but back then, everybody said there were demons. Today, we're much more scientifically literate, and so you know, people say it must be aliens in science fiction. Um, but ha-ha, you know, we just have common tendencies toward these fanciful um, things. So the author is like, not ridiculing, but setting aside the whole idea that any of this is real. It's like, well, maybe the medieval people were right. I don't think that everything that's reported is necessarily true, but there's a small enough set of things that you kind of wonder about. I personally don't have a problem saying that's demonic activity, especially when you look at um, some of the occult leaders in the 20th century claiming to channel beings and how the consistent message from these alleged beings is that Christianity is holding humanity back. And by the way, if anybody's interested in the subject, there's an excellent video from Gary Bates of uh, Christian Ministries International. Um, I'm drawing a blank. How do you remember the name? Uh, yeah, it's, it's about aliens. There's, uh, we actually have that DVD. Okay, it, 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 it's very good. He interviews a lot of people who've been through this. And the interesting thing is, yeah. people are having these terrible experiences, and when they invoke the name of Jesus, the whole thing stops. Why would aliens be affected by the name of Jesus? So. Okay, another question. Here. Yes. Uh, planets like Venus and Mars are seen. Is that because of their relative closeness to Earth or their gases? Like stars shine bright, their gases. Is that why we see certain planets? Is because of their gases or their relative closeness to us? Uh, because of the relative closeness. So stars produce light, and they, they shine it toward us. That's how we see them. Um, planets like Venus and Mars and even our moon reflect light from the sun onto us. They're, they're not emitting light on their own. Okay, other questions? I see one more here. Do you mind if I put you on the spot? Go for it. So uh, Isaiah, or 2 Kings, when Isaiah goes to see Hezekiah, mm -hmm. and he's asking about the shadow, shall I go down the stairs or up the stairs? Do you have any idea what happened there? God is sovereign. He, he can do whatever he wants. Um, he set up the universe to operate according to the laws of physics, but he can step in and suspend them at any point. Um, he did that with Christ being born of a virgin. I mean, that's not how biology works, but it did then. Uh, miracles, you know, he doesn't usually choose to do miracles, but he can step in and do whatever he wants whenever he wants. Um, a skeptic wouldn't like that explanation. Um, if I had the opportunity to engage with a skeptic, I'd say, well, your model includes miracles at the very beginning, too. The difference between us is that I recognize mine and you're refusing to acknowledge yours. Um, because the Big Bang model violates laws of physics in the very beginning of it. So if you're believing in a model that violates physics, you're believing in a miracle, right? So that, anyway, that's not what you asked, but. <laughs> uh, I, 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 I cheerfully acknowledge believing in miracles because without the supernatural, the universe couldn't be here anyway. So. Is it true that the core of the earth has stopped rotating and that North will become south, and south will become north. Um, boy, there's... I don't know that it stopped. I'm, I, I've seen the... I believe I've, I've seen the, the news you're referring to. Part of that depends on your understanding of what's going on down there. Um, the secular modelers have trouble explaining how the north and south poles can switch to begin with, because their dynamo theory shouldn't be able to do that and if it could do that, it couldn't do it very quickly. There's evidence, though, that not only has it happened, it has happened quickly. Um, a brief example, um, when rock is above a certain temperature, it loses magnetism. Or I should say that the, the, the metal within it will. When it cools down again, 
the magnetic field at that moment gets imprinted into it, in a sense. There are rock formations where the magnetic field imprinting, so to speak, is different orientations at different parts of the formation. Now we can calculate this particular formation came out of a volcano and would have taken X amount of time to cool, maybe a few months. Uh, how did the magnetic field switch in a matter of months? The secular viewpoint can't explain that and tends to not even address it because it just doesn't make sense to them. Um, but since we're not limited to their point of view, there have been creation people looking at questions of the core and what's actually going on down there that have a bit different viewpoint on that. Um, I'm not sure if that answered your question directly, other than to say there's different viewpoints about what's going on down there in the first place. Um, we, we can't view it directly, obviously. We're just... Okay, uh, we're going to end the time for questions. Thank you. Uh, uh, can, can, can I say can one more thing? Uh, yeah. uh, uh, let, let, me, let me plug the Dry Falls trip. If you haven't been out there, it's spectacular. Yeah. Uh, and my talk tomorrow night, Distant Starlight, how do you see things so far away in a young, created universe? We mentioned it briefly tonight, but I just want to be more explicit. Okay. Well, thank you, and give me a hand. Thank you, everyone, for your attention. <laughs>